All right, well, it's very, very good to be with you this morning, and I want to talk about creation evangelism. What does creation have to do with evangelism? Quite a lot, actually, and that's what I wanted to share with you today. I want to, I want to ask this question, how can we be more effective in our efforts to make disciples of all nations? That, wouldn't that be wonderful if all the nations recognized that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords and obeyed him and served him? I mean, we would not have the, the kinds of problems that we have in our society. Because if you think about it, every problem we have can be traced back to a broken law of God where people have decided we're not going to do what God's word says, we're going to do things our own way. That causes problems. And we as Christians have an obligation to go and tell people that they need to repent and uh, trust in Jesus, believe the gospel, and then obey. Uh, Matthew 28, 19, the resurrected Lord appeared before his disciples, he, and he told them, he says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And, of course, that extends to us as well. We're followers of Christ. We're disciples, and uh, we're supposed to go into the world and, and preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations, make them followers of Christ. Now, we can't change a person's heart, but we can certainly present the gospel and reason with people and encourage them, urge them to repent and trust the gospel, knowing that only the Holy Spirit can change a person's heart. We understand that. But we need to do our part. And I want to suggest we haven't been maybe as effective as we could be, and I think we can be more effective. How, how do we do that? Well, we're to go and make disciples of all nations. We're to baptize them. That implies conversion. That implies that we're, we're preaching the gospel and that people are receiving it and they're trusting in Christ and they get baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's a Trinitarian reference. It's not the names of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's the name. There's one name, Yahweh, the, the living God. And he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. It's not just about salvation. It's about obedience as well. And it's, that, it's listed in the proper order, right? They repent, they trust in Christ, and then you obey him. You don't obey Christ in order to be saved because we've all fallen short there. We're saved by God's grace, received through faith in Christ, not from works. But then out of gratitude for our salvation, we obey Christ, and because it, it, things go better for us if we obey God. Obviously, he, he loves to pour out his blessings on those who are obedient to him. And Jesus says, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. But I want to focus on this, uh, this verse, 19, go therefore. And whenever you see therefore in scripture, that's an indication that, that, that what is coming next it follows logically from what came previously. We use that word, therefore, in the conclusion of an argument. You know, in light of this, in light of that, in light of this, therefore, it follows that we should do this. So it makes you, it makes you wonder, what, what is it that Jesus just said previous to this for which it follows that we should go and make disciples of all nations? What came before this? Well, uh, verse 18 came before this. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's the reason why we need to go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus has been installed as King of kings and Lord of lords. And so he's told us, in light of the fact, therefore, you go, right? In light of the fact that Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and earth, you go and tell everybody. And I have to tell you, this, this verse is... Uh, Problematic for some Christians because of our theology. It kind of rubs us the wrong way. And when that happens, you need to reevaluate th your theology because the scriptures do not need to be adjusted. It's your theology sometimes that needs to be adjusted. And in particular, some, some Christians, I guess because of the way society is, would like to read this. Jesus saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven, but there's, pretty much, there's nothing I can do about the earth, sorry. It's kind of going downhill and spiraling out of control and, you know, you just, just trust in that, I'm, you know, at some, at some point I'm going to come and save you. But that's not what the verse says. It says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, which means Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords now over all nations. That's interesting. Now, I'll be the first to admit not everyone recognizes that. And that's the point of the verse that follows. The reason we're supposed to go and tell people is because Jesus is king of kings now. And we need to tell people that. We need to tell the leaders of our nation. You better, trust, you better obey Christ. You better make good laws, laws that are consistent with the scriptures. Because if you don't, you will stand before the throne of God and answer for it. We need to tell people that. Just be blunt with them and say, look, because I care about you, you need to repent and trust the gospel. 
The other way in which some people try to interpret this verse is uh, Jesus saying, all authority will be given to me in heaven on earth. He'll be king someday. No, he's king now. He's king now. Not everyone recognizes that. There will be a point in the future where everyone will recognize that, right? Because there's going to be, Jesus is going to come again, and all opposition is going to be destroyed, ultimately. But in the meantime, right now, God rules in the midst of his enemies. That's uh, Psalm 110, verse 2. Christ rules in the midst. He, He allows his enemies to exist for a while. But if they don't repent, they get destroyed, ultimately. So we need to go and tell people. And if you think about it, the United States, we have a tremendous Christian heritage. Our nation founded primarily by Christians for the purpose of worshiping God freely. It's wonderful. What a blessing. And if you think about it, for all these Christian resources we have in this nation, it certainly seems like our nation is becoming less Christian every day. Now, how, how can that be happening and, and, and why? What's, what's going on here? So in light of the fact that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, can we be more effective in uh, proclaiming the gospel to this nation and around the world? And I want to suggest that to be effective in our efforts to make disciples of all the nations, every Christian should be ready to articulate and defend Genesis for three reasons. So I'm going to suggest there's a connection between Genesis and making disciples of all nations, including this one. And the first uh, reason for this is because Genesis is foundational to the gospel. You need to understand that our society, there there are some problems in our society right now. Would you agree with that? (laughs) Yeah. Um, And in order for those to be solved, uh, people need to repent and trust the gospel. Our society is not going to be saved by politics. It's not. And I'm all for doing what we can politically, but... Uh, if it's going to be sa- if it's going to be saved, it's going to be through repentance, massive repentance. That's what we need, and people need to trust the gospel, repent and believe the gospel. But the gospel is based in Genesis. Do you realize that? Where do we get the idea that uh, death is the penalty for sin? That's in Genesis, isn't it? Jesus. I mean, the gospel is that Jesus died on the cross in our place, right? He took our sins and paid for them. But where do we get the idea that death's the penalty for sin? That's in Genesis. Where do we uh, get the idea that that we need a redeemer, that a redeemer will come into the world? That's Genesis 3.15. God promised that a descendant of Eve would crush the head of the serpent, that he would take care of this problem of sin. The Messiah was promised back in Genesis. And putting it this way, which Adam is non-essential to the gospel? Is it the first Adam that made it necessary for us to be saved? Or the last Adam, Jesus Christ? who made salvation happen for his people. You see, without the first Adam, the last Adam doesn't make any sense, really. Because what are we being saved from? You can't really fully understand the gospel apart from Genesis, because the gospel's the good news, and Genesis really presents the bad news, doesn't it? It tells us why we need a savior. Uh, it's, It's in Genesis where we learn that it's by man that death came into the world. The original world wasn't like it is today. I mean, there were some similarities, but it was, a, it was a world that God himself called very good. He saw everything he'd made, and it was very good. It wasn't full of the death and suffering we see today. That's the result of sin. But most people today are taught in schools that, uh, no, Genesis, that's just a fairy tale. The real way life came about is millions of years of evolution. And if that's the case, then death is not the penalty for sin. Right? Because if, if it's by millions of years of death came man, then it's not by man came death. Those are logically contrary positions. They cannot both be true. Uh, the, the way that we look at these fossils, and by the way, I'd expect to find fossils all over the earth because there was a worldwide flood. That's going to kill organisms, bury them in sediment. They're going to uh, permineralize, fossilize. and we, I'd expect that. We find marine fossils on, on the highest mountaintops. Not surprising, there was a worldwide flood. But my secular colleagues, when they look at the fossils, they're looking at it through a secular lens and they interpret them differently. They interpret the fossils as being deposited gradually, not with one you know, worldwide flood, but gradually over hundreds of millions of years. Now, it's not like the fossils come with labels telling you they're millions of years old, but that's the way they interpret them because of their worldview. And historically, this really began in the 1700s, 1800s, when uh, secular scientists came along and said, well, you know, these rock layers, we're pretty confident they're millions of years old. There was no worldwide flood. 
And a lot of the theologians, not all of them, but a lot of them compromised and said, well, maybe we can allow that interpretation in scripture. But you need to understand that any, any view that has fossils being millions of years old is contrary to the idea that death is the result of Adam's sin. Because we all agree human beings don't go back hundreds of millions of years. Even the secularists admit that. Human beings are recent. And so which is it? Is it the evolutionary view in which, you know, by death came man? Or is it the, the Christian view, the biblical view, by man came death? They're logically contrary. When the world was first created, God saw everything he'd made, and behold, it was very good, according to Scripture. But if fossils are hundreds of millions of years old, and they were already there, and animals had been living and dying and ripping each other apart for millions of years and disease and so on. And you got the Garden of Eden sitting on top of millions of years of death and suffering. And God calling it very good? That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. You can't, it, Christian theology doesn't make sense on an evolutionary foundation. It really doesn't. The Bible's clear the world was very good. Today, the world we live in, uh, not very good. Oh, there's still good things. There's still a lot of beauty in the world. There's a lot of good in the world still. God hasn't abandoned us completely. Praise God. But we live in a broken world, a world that's cursed as a result of Adam's sin. And the good news is, it's gonna be made very good again. There's gonna be a new heavens and a new earth. And if you think about it, the, the only way, if, if we were allowed into that new earth in our sinful state, we'd ruin it. Because if you think about it, how many sins did it take to ruin the world? Just one, yeah. And it wasn't like murder. It was just, he, he ate a fruit. Right? He broke his diet. But it was something that God told him not to do. And so he had committed treason against King of Kings, and that's a capital offense. One sin ruined the world. So God said, in the new earth, that's going to remain perfect forever. And that means not one sin can come into it, which means we can't come into it in our sinful state. We need a Savior. See, that's the gospel starting from Genesis. You got to, you got to, understand the bad news in order to understand the good news. And the bad news begins in Genesis. The gospel's promised in Genesis. If you don't understand that, then when somebody dies, I mean, a lot of people are inclined to blame God. Some God of love you are. Why didn't you, why didn't you heal this person? Why did you allow that person to die? And you see, if you, have, if you have an evolutionary worldview, then yeah, you can blame God for that. If you have a proper biblical worldview, you realize, well, we live in a broken, fallen world. Of course, there's going to be death and suffering. When we rebelled against God, that's basically what we were asking him for. Is we, don't, we don't want you. We don't want the God of life. We want death. God's, okay, I'll give you a little taste of that. So we understand when somebody dies that we should understand, based on Genesis, that, yeah, that's, that's what we all deserve. And that's coming for me, too, right? That's the, when, I look, when I see a grave, that's, you know, I'm going to be in there someday. I'm going to be, I'm going to be dead. And that's what I deserve. Right? And so we need to thank God that he, that he didn't kill us in our sleep last night, because that is what we deserve. Every breath you take, because of God's grace, that's something to think about. So we need to be grateful for the window of life that he, gets, that he gives us, and the fact that if we just repent and believe the gospel, he'll resurrect us, and uh, we'll get to live with him forever. So Genesis really is foundational to the gospel. It's really foundational to all Christian principles and doctrines. Now, Christian thinking, the Christian worldview is under attack today. There's no doubt about that. But you need to understand that all these Christian principles really have their foundation in Genesis, in creation. Think about uh, the fact that we have laws, that we have certain rights. Uh, well, that goes back to creation. There's a lawgiver. God has the right to make the rules. That's in Genesis we learn about that. Our nation founded on Christian principles, creationist principles, right? Our own Declaration of Independence. Uh, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they have been endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Yes, it's a creationist document. And it makes no sense for us to have rights if we're just rearranged pawn scum. Really. Or marriage. Why, why would you have this, this idea of marriage being one man and one woman united by God? Where does that go back to? It's Genesis, isn't it? God, God created the family the family unit, he did that in Genesis, and the Bible specifically tells us in Genesis 2 that that's the reason why we have marriage today. But you see, if marriage is just, if, if Adam and Eve, if that's just a fairy tale, then marriage doesn't have a foundation in, uh, in history. It's just a trend. 
standards of behavior, meaning of life. Why is it that human life is so valuable? Why is it I can't go out and just shoot somebody I don't like? Because that person's made in the image of God. And where do we learn about that? Oh yeah, that's in Genesis, isn't it? Where God where made man in his own image, meaning that he reflects in some capacity God's character. But then again, if evolution were true, those standards would not make sense. Logically, different standards would follow from that. Uh, why would you have laws? If evolution is all about the strong dominating over the weak, why would you have laws that are designed to protect the weak from the strong, which is what laws are for? Or why not do what you want with sex, for that matter? If we're just animals, they kind of do what they want. Or abortion. I mean, Christians have, fight, have been fighting abortion, but you see, abortion makes sense in an evolutionary worldview. Get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. If we're just animals, why not? If it's convenient. It's in the Christian worldview where we can say, no, abortion is murder because human beings are made in the image of God. We learned that in Genesis. So you can't defend these Christian doctrines if you remove that foundation. And that's what's happened in our society because we've shifted from a creation-based view to an evolution view in the, in the majority of uh, the minds of the majority of people. That's what's taught at almost all the universities. Even a lot of Christian universities now teach evolution, that God used it somehow. You can't defend marriage in that view. You can't, or any Christian doctrine, really. We need to recognize our foundations are under attack, and if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? So Genesis is foundational to gospel. It's foundational to all Christian principles and doctrines. And then the third principle, I want to spend the most time on this one because it's really profound. Our culture is very much like the Greeks that are mentioned in the New Testament. In the time in which the New Testament was written, uh, Rome had conquered the world. And before that, Greece had conquered the world. There was the Greek Empire. And Greek thinking permeated the world, uh, except for these, this little nation that God had chosen to be his special nation, the nation of Israel. Israel was divided then into Israel and Judah. The northern tribes were scattered. At the time of Christ's ministry, there was Judah. So uh, you have the Jews, and on the other hand, you have everybody else. And the Bible refers to those as Greeks. Doesn't necessarily mean they're from Greece. It just means they're not Jewish. So they're Gentiles. You're either Jews or Gentiles. God's not a racist. God, uh, in fact, biblically, going back to Genesis, there's only one race, the human race. We are all descended from Adam. Uh, I have other resources that talk about how you get the different, different you know, skin shades and things like that. But we're all descended from Adam and Eve. But God does recognize that we grow up in different cultural backgrounds, and that affects the way we think about things. And the Jews had a very different cultural background than pretty much everybody else in the world at that time because they had, they had experienced God in a marvelous way. They had revelation from God, written revelation from God, the Bible, the Old Testament. And therefore, the way in which Greeks and Jews think about salvation will be different. 1 Corinthians one twenty three says, but we preach Christ crucified, that's the gospel, to the Jews, it's a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, it's foolishness. Not because it has anything to do with race or anything like that, it has to do with their cultural background. To the, the, to the Jews, Christ crucified, the message of Jesus dying on the cross, it was a stumbling block, it was something they had to overcome, it was, it was a difficulty for them. But for the Greeks, it was foolishness. Why? Well, let's back up a little bit, a couple of verses. Verse 21, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. Paul's using a little play on words here. He was very good at that uh, under divine inspiration, of course. The wisdom of God, which is genuine wisdom, the, the world doesn't come to know God through its wisdom. Secular wisdom isn't really wisdom at all. It's foolishness to God. And so this is why you can't reason somebody into heaven. You can certainly reason with them, but they need a change of heart in order to embrace the gospel because through their own intellect, they're not gonna to come to God. Through secular reasoning, you're not gonna to come to God. The Bible tells us that here. And therefore, God was well pleased through the foolishness, what the world considers foolish, of the message preached to save those who believe. Okay, because you're, none of us are smart enough to come to God on our own. God tells us to present the gospel and he gives us faith to accept that, to believe it. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. 
And this again goes back to the different cultural background. The Jews understood that they needed a savior because the Jews understood that, uh, they understood creation, they understood that God made the world, that Adam was a real person who was initially good, but then he fell into sin, he rebelled against God, and we've inherited that sin nature from Adam, and so we need a savior. What, that's what they're looking for, signs, signs of the Messiah, signs of the Messiah. That's what they're looking for. And they, most of them missed it when the Messiah came. Some of them did, but, but most of them missed it. The Greeks, on the other hand, search for wisdom. Why? They're not looking for a Messiah because they have no conception of sin, of death being the penalty for sin, of human beings have a sin nature. In Greek thinking, people are basically good. People are basically good. In the, Jew, in the Jewish thinking, people are basically wicked. And that's, that's, that's what the Bible teaches. And so we need a savior. We need somebody to turn our heart around. The Greeks, people are basically good. And so why do we have problems in society? The Greeks would say, well, it's, it's the reason people occasionally do bad things is because of ignorance. They don't know any better. And so if you think the problem is ignorance, the solution would be education, right? Knowledge, wisdom. And so that's what the Greeks are searching for, wisdom. Not genuine wisdom, but but nonetheless, worldly wisdom. So it's in that context when we read verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block to the Greeks' foolishness. Christ is a stumbling block to the Jews because he didn't come in the way that they were expecting. They should have been, there's plenty of information there. Uh, the Bible does present the Messiah in one sense as a king who rules over the nations and destroys those who rebel against him, which, which that's true. But when Jesus first came, he came as a suffering servant. And now, now that's in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53. But it seems like the Jews were kind of blinded to that. They weren't able to piece that together. And so when you, when you explain to them that, no, wait a minute, you go back through the Old Testament, the Messiah needed to suffer first and do what the Father commanded him to do for, for him to then be given all authority in heaven and earth. And so that's a stumbling block that they had to overcome. But to the Greeks, the idea of the Lord dying on a cross and, and bleeding out, and that's foolishness to them. And if you think about it, that's the way most people think about Christianity today. I mean, we sang about the, the blood of Jesus, and they're like, why do you, you know, what's, what's it with you guys in blood, and what's that all about? Because they have no conception of the fact that death is the penalty for sin. And we're all related, we're all of one blood. That's why Jesus can substitute for us on the cross. You see, the Jews, for the Jews, the gospel was a stumbling block, but the Jews understood Genesis and creation. They understood that God created man good, but, but man rebelled against God. The Greeks believed in polytheistic evolution. You thought Darwin invented evolution? No. Darwin popularized a particular version of it, but the idea of life coming about by chance and changing and evolving is very, very ancient. The, uh, the Greeks believed in a polytheistic version of evolution. If you read uh, Empedocles, for example, he wrote about how the four elements air, earth, fire, water, come, came together and formed the first life, and some of it was unsuccessful. You'd have like the head of a horse on the body of a hippopotamus, and so that doesn't work, and, and so on. But eventually, kind of the combinations came together. It's, it's, a, it's an early version of evolution. It's really kind of interesting. Uh, so they had no concept of original creation and a fall. The uh, Jews understood that death's a penalty for sin, because that's a Genesis concept. They understood creation, they understood Adam's rebelling against God brought, brought death, which is an enemy into the world. For Greeks, death is normal. It's a normal part of the world. Death's always existed and will always exist. The Jews understood the fall of man, that man was created good, but we're now wicked because we're, we're, descended, we're sinners descended from sinners. We desire to sin and we do so freely. To Greeks, there's no fall. There's no fall there. Humans are basically good. Problem is we just, we don't know enough, we're ignorant. Jews, man needs salvation, salvation from sin. Greeks say salvation from what? That makes no sense to them. Man's basically good, why would we need to be saved? And then so the Jews understand that the solution to man's problems is Christ. The Greeks thinking, well no, the problem is ignorance, therefore the solution is education. Now on those two lists, I want you to consider society today outside the church are people more like thinking like the Jews or more like the Greeks? More like the Greeks, our society. I mean, you go to any secular university 
And they believe all those things on that right list. All of them, except the evolution, they would say it's probably atheistic evolution rather than polytheistic. But their worldview is very similar to the Greeks. That's interesting. That's interesting. You see, the Jews understood that Adam was created good, but fell into sin. We're his descendants, we freely sin against God and therefore rightly deserve death. The Jews understood substitutionary atonement. That was the point of those animal sacrifices. Animal sacrifices never saved anyone because the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins, the Bible says in Hebrews 10.4. So why did God institute that? To teach the Israelites about substitution. The idea that this innocent animal, you, you deserve death, this innocent animal doesn't, and yet it's, it dies in your place, and you live in its place. And that pointed forward to the Messiah who would actually pay the penalty for sin and die in our place, you see. That's the whole point of that. Jews understood that. They understood the substitutionary atonement. They understood we, we need a savior and that God has promised to send one. The stumbling block for them is that Jesus is that promised savior. He didn't come in quite the way that they were expecting. For the Greeks, uh, man is an accidental product of the gods or the four elements or what have you. Death has always existed, will always exist. It's a normal part of the world. You wanna be good, do good. And by the way, that's every religion apart from Christianity. Christianity says, you can't be good enough. Don't even try. You need, you need, you need to repent and you need to believe the gospel. Uh, the Greeks, we need education. That's, that's the solution. And so then when you present to Greeks, oh, trust in Jesus as your savior, they say, that makes no sense whatsoever because they do not have the Genesis background in order to understand it. You see, in order to understand the good news, you need to understand the bad news. In order to understand that Jesus died on the cross in place of you, you need to understand, well, that's what I deserve because Adam sinned and I'm descended from him. I sin freely. I've committed high treason against the King of Kings. That's a capital offense. I've sinned against an infinitely holy God. I deserve an infinite death, but Christ takes my place. The Jews of the, of the early uh, first century understood the bad news. The Greeks didn't. Totally different worldview. And the interesting thing about this is the Bible actually gives us examples of how to present and defend the gospel with Jews and with Greeks. It gives us some examples there. Very, very useful for our thinking. Now, it's the same gospel. There's no doubt about that. But when you're presenting the gospel to Jews, you do not need to give them the background that they already have because they understand Genesis. But when you're sharing the gospel with Greeks, it makes no sense, it's foolishness to them until you give them the background to understand it. And this is uh, explained in Acts chapter two and Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter two, we get a wonderful example of Peter preaching the gospel to Jews. In Acts 17, we get a wonderful example of Paul preaching the gospel to Greeks. And the details are different. It's the same gospel, but the way they present it is different because Peter did not have to give the background information to the Jews that Paul did have to give to the Gentiles, to the Greeks. Let me show you this. Very, I know I won't go through all these verses, but just hit some of the highlights. Acts 2, verse 5. Now, there were Jews living in Jerusalem. That's hardly surprising. That's the capital city, right? You got Jerusalem there. Devout men from every nation under heaven. So not just Jews, but other ethnicities. But they're devout men. These are people who love the Lord. But they haven't yet recognized that Jesus is, is the Lord. In verse 14, Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea, all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. He says, you should have recognized this. This is in the scriptures. Joel talked about this. And he quotes that. He goes back and quotes that. Verse 22, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. You saw the miracles, right? You saw this happen. That was God. These were predicted in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. The, the cross was not something that took God by surprise. It was exactly what he planned. Now, that the people are still responsible for it. It was still wicked for, for them to crucify the only man who doesn't deserve death, right? So you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But that was part of God's plan. That was part of God's plan. He planned it. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. 
This is the Messiah that we've been looking for for thousands of years. He finally came. You killed him. But don't worry. It was part of God's plan. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. They understood it. They understood that they crucified the Messiah. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they did. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. That was awesome. Peter preached a very good message, and the people responded in droves. And it's wonderful. 3,000 were saved and baptized. Now we have a very different situation in Acts 17, where Paul is in Athens. Now Athens is the heart of of Greece. Okay, this, and and Greeks, their, their thinking is secular. So this is, the, this is the heart of academia. The, the Greeks tended to pride themselves on as being great thinkers. You, you, know, you have Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, and uh, you know, those were a few centuries earlier, but nonetheless, their, their influence continued at this time. You can think of Athens. This would be like an Ivy League university today that's completely secular, that uh, you know, Christians going into there, it's like going into the lion's den. That's, and that's where Paul is. He's right in the midst of one of the most secular places on earth. Now, there are Jews there too, but the majority of the population would be Greeks. So his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. He's seeing, because remember, the Greeks were polytheistic. They had multiple gods, and they would build images of their gods and sit them in the temple and worship them and, and bring them sacrifices and so on. So Paul, he was reasoning in the synagogue. He's, he's dialoguing with people. He's helping them to understand things. He's reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and, uh, and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be present. Those would primarily be Greeks in the marketplace, okay? So he's not just sticking to the synagogues. He's going out into the marketplace and he's witnessing. He's, he's telling people about Christ and he's reasoning with them, helping them to understand uh, why they need a savior. So in verse 18, also uh, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. There were, uh, Epicureans and Stoics were two of the secular uh, schools of thought that existed at the time. There were were six major philosophies that existed back then uh, that were all um, Greek in terms of thinking, all secular. Epicureans and Stoics were two of those. So the Bible's giving us information here that these are not God-fearing people. These are secularists, okay? They, They do have a belief in multiple gods, but certainly not the biblical God. They're conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? The, uh, actually, the Greek words for idle babbler would be a seed picker. It's referring to a kind of bird that picks seeds out of dung. They are not complimenting him, okay? <laughs> Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. The word Jesus is masculine, in Greek, the word resurrection is a feminine word in Greek, and so they think maybe he's preaching two two new gods. And because remember, the the Greek gods are kind of like uber humans. They married, and you know, there's male and female. So maybe it's Jesus and the resurrection. There's a new divine couple. They're not understanding it. They're not understanding it. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. That was a that was the elite council of scholars that existed at the time. They met on what's called Mars Hill. That's what Areopagus means. And at this time, they probably weren't meeting on the hill, but they still had that name. The, again, these are, the, these are the PhDs of the ancient world, and they are as secular as you can possibly get. And they say, we, may we know what this new teaching is, what you're proclaiming? You're talking about this Jesus and the resurrection stuff, for you're bringing some strange things to our ears, and we want to know what these things mean. Are they genuinely interested? I don't think so, because the next verse says, now all the Athenians and strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new much like many academics today. We, we, you know, we want to hear this interesting story you're telling because, frankly, we think you're crazy. And it's just interesting, you know. We like to, uh, you know, and then we'll, we'll make fun of you after it and tell you why you're an idiot. So, hey, I've experienced that. So don't get me wrong. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you're very religious in all respects. 
uh, meaning you, you, you know, you have, he's, he's not complimenting, it's not religious in a positive sense. Some translations say superstitious. He, he's observing that they have a, an organized religion, they have gods and so on. He says, for while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription to an unknown god. They, the Greeks had so many different gods that they worshiped that were as allegedly con in control of different aspects of nature, the, the ocean, the sky, and so on, and the harvest. And they, they wanted to make sure that they didn't offend any that they might have missed. So they had an altar to an unknown God. And Paul jumps on that because he says, let me tell you, there is a God that you missed. And it's the only one you should be worshiping. So therefore, what you proclaim, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. Let me tell you about this God that you missed. And then what does he do? He goes back to Genesis. The God who made the world and all things in it. He's a creator, he's created the universe. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God made the heavens and the earth. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. He says, your religion makes no sense. You worship gods, but your gods are statues in a temple. They can't even get off the shelf, <laughs> right? He says, the, any god who has the name God is, it doesn't need to be you know, served by human hands, right? He doesn't dwell in temples, Right? Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. So they went and offered sacrifices to these statues. He says, God doesn't, need, God doesn't need that. Since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. He doesn't need you, you need him. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. He's talking about Adam, right? And it's just, oh, it's just amazing. He's refuting their worldview. Um, he goes on and says, for in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we're, we're his offspring also. And he says, he's reasoning with them. How would that make sense to talk about, you know, even your own poets have admitted we're children of God in the, in the sense if you've trusted in him. Uh, but how would that make sense if your gods are made up of stone and gold and silver, right? Being then the children of God, we ought not to think the divine nature is like gold or silver, or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man, Therefore, God, having overlooked uh, the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he's appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So he gets, he gets to the resurrection. But you notice what he did. He started with Genesis. He had to refute their wrong worldview, their incorrect view of the nature of reality, and replace it with the biblical worldview starting in Genesis. And the, he laid down that foundation in order for them to make sense of the gospel. And what was the response? It's threefold. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. So that's the first category. They, of course, they were already mocking him. Some of them continued to mock him. It, it had no effect on him. But others said, well, she'll hear you again concerning this. We want to hear more. You know, we're not, we're not persuaded yet, but we'd like to hear more. And amazingly, some believed some men joined him and believed, among whom also were uh, Dionysius, the Areopagite, one of the members of the Areopagus, this secular group of the PhDs of the ancient world, was convinced and believed and became saved. Amazing. Also a woman named Damaris, we don't know much about her, but apparently she was a person of some importance because her name is mentioned specifically. So some people have the misconception that Paul wasn't really very effective because not very many people were saved. But when you consider who he was talking to, he was extremely effective. A lot of people think, well, we should, we should preach like Acts 2, because lots of people were saved. Folks, Peter was preaching to believers in God. Paul was preaching to secularists. The Bible's not giving us a good example and a bad example. It's giving us two good examples of how to deal with different groups of people, those who already have the background to understand the gospel and those who don't. Now here's the interesting thing. Our culture today is increasingly like the Greeks of Acts 17, yet most Christians use an Acts 2 approach to evangelism. Let that sink in. We need to think and defend the faith in the way that Paul did in Acts 17 if we're gonna have any uh, positive influence on our society. Now granted, sometimes you can do an Acts 2 sermon and people will appreciate it because we do have a Christian heritage in this nation. Not everybody's like the Greeks but many are. And if we wanna see our nation turned around, we need to be able to defend Genesis and, uh, and use that to explain the gospel. So our, we need to remember that our culture really is very much like the Greeks. 
Uh, I'm out of time, but I, 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 do have a, I do have this presentation on DVD, a little longer version of it actually. And uh, a, another uh, DVD you might want to get is called Understanding Genesis, and it shows how Christian doctrines go back to the beginning. So let me show you just a few, of the, a few other of the resources we have out here. Understanding Genesis, how to uh, defend the literal history of Genesis, that the Bible really is accurate in what it says there. The ultimate proof of creation, if you want to give a bulletproof argument for biblical creation, this is the book you want to get. This is, this is going to help you to think and debate the way that Jesus did in his earthly ministry. And Jesus was not the sort of person you wanted to debate against. Trust me on that. And we have the DVD on that as well, The Ultimate Proof of Creation. Keeping faith in an age of reason, answering over 400 alleged Bible contradictions. You've heard people say that. You can't trust the Bible because that contradicts that. It's not true, but I wrote a book on it. Uh, discerning truth, uh, how to, how to um, answer the logical fallacies that evolutionists often use to try and make their argument. There's no good argument for, for evolution, okay? Uh, it's just, um, th that's gonna help you to think through those. Introduction to logic, how to reason better. And you could use that as a curriculum. I have a teacher's guide if you wanna use it with, you know, to ho with homeschool families or whatever, or if you just wanna get better at reasoning. Dinosaurs in the Bible is a fun resource that I think a lot of people have an interest. How do dinosaurs fit into the biblical timeline? There's a lot to say about that. Uh, youngsters really like this one too. And we do have a lot of children's resources. We don't, uh, we don't do these on the websites, but we did bring them because children are, they need to be prepared for the world they're going to enter. And so please get some of those. Uh, my specialty field of astronomy, I have a number of resources on that. Taking back astronomy, Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, how to enjoy the night sky from a Christian perspective, that's a fun resource. Yeah, Created Cosmos is a, kind of a movie. It takes you through the, the universe from a creation perspective. Uh, Secret Code of Creation, this is a really neat one. It shows you how God has built beauty and complexity into an aspect of creation you probably never even thought about. And I submit there is no secular explanation for what you're gonna see here, and it is beautiful, which is why this is one we also have on Blu-ray if you wanna get that. You can get the, uh, the main books together for 20% discount, the main uh, videos together for 20% discount. You can get all of the main resources and have an, a, an immediate creation library, and that's for a 30% discount. So that'll probably put me out of business, but that's okay, we want you to get this stuff. And, uh, cause it really makes, it, it really matters, folks. I've seen people who have come to faith in Christ, and I've been able to reason with them, and oh, it's, it's wonderful to see. It's just wonderful to see. We do have a free newsletter. Please sign up for that. It is free. Uh, it's an electronic newsletter, so put your email address or you'll get nothing. Um, and it is free. Not too many things free in this world, just salvation and our newsletter. So there you go. And check us out on the web as well, biblicalscienceinstitute.com. Thank you very much. I'm gonna go ahead and close in prayer. So please, uh, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you freely. We pray that uh, you will continue to allow us to have that privilege. Uh, Lord, we pray that this uh, message will embolden people and that they'll be able, encouraged to, to share the gospel with others and to do it in a way that's effective, Lord. And we pray that you would bring repentance to many, many people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. Awesome.